Okay, we are, this is our first recording here in three, two, one. Hello, Megwin. Hello, Bill. <laughs> okay, today is our first call in, um, well, I guess the initially we're calling it New Directions in Healing Therapy. Now, whatever that might be or how that might develop is yet to be seen, but we've had just to give people a context for it, we've had conversations the past couple of weeks. Some posts you put on Facebook, we have mutual interests in healing therapy. However, you're coming from a very different perspective than I do. And we just had a couple of weeks of conversations that it's like, you know, I think there's a lot more people that could benefit from it than just from us. So what if we got on a call and talked to each other each week and had fun like we did, you know, just by ourselves. And now we record it and there's other people that can benefit and understand from, I don't know, I've, I've had close to two decades worth of knowledge and experience in body work and martial arts and you have your own respective um, modalities and things that you have trained with. So let's share that. Yes, let's share it. Yeah. Let's see what happens. So I would like, right now, I would like to, for you to share your background. Like, so people get an idea of who Megwin is. Um, and yeah, just, just share your background. Okay, well, I would say that I kind of have been on this healing journey for most of my life. Mm hmm and that it has been a calling for most of my life. Um, I'd really like to share with people that it really started in many ways in my childhood. Um, as a young child, I was very expressive. I was very, always into art and you know, wanting to perform and just trying to be as expressive as possible, and that gave me a lot of joy and pleasure. And uh, also in my childhood, I was you know, unfortunately the victim of sexual trauma. And I, I guess I, I definitely classify as the sort of wounded healer type. So I had that wound, and initially I used uh, performing as a way to start to find myself again and to access the energy of feeling. And I did that for most of my childhood into my early adulthood, where I studied acting at NYU and studied uh, physical approaches to acting. So it was, it was kind of a different style than say the classic sort of method acting but there I got exposed to a lot of different uh, physical practices that were you know really showing me that the emotional energy is really laid in the body mm -hmm. and after I graduated I was planning on becoming an actress and you know going into that direction and uh, September 11th happened ah. shortly after I graduated and that just kind of threw my system into a, um, I kind of use this term now, it was like a resonant trauma. Mm -hmm. That experience awakened a lot of this old trauma that I had had as a child and mm -hmm. stuff that I didn't realize I hadn't really dealt with on a deeper level kind mm -hmm. of came up. Yeah, go and, ahead. And, and what I'd really, for those that aren't familiar with you, what makes September 11th so significant for you is you live in New York City. Right. Yeah. So that that is like it was like up front in your face. You're experiencing this trauma. You're surrounded by a city of people who have experienced the trauma as well. So I yes. think that is a really important piece in the equation in terms of what you have to share. Yeah. I mean, and just to even set it up even um, a little bit more was that I woke up on September 11th. And that was actually the day that I was to perform for agents and talent scouts. Mm. Um, I had gotten picked out of like 500 students. There was like 26 of us that got to perform for these agents and talent scouts. So this was literally like, you know, the thing I had been waiting for my whole life. It's like, no, I'm going to get discovered. Now I'm going to, you know, like it starts, it begins, right? So I had my rollerblades on. I was like ready to exercise, like get into action. I was in such a good mood this day. You have no idea. Uh -huh. And I, you know, putting on my rollerblades and my new 
landlord. I just moved into a new home Mm -hmm. on September 1st, and it was the first time I'd ever lived alone. And he's coming down the street like a warrior, and he's saying, the world is coming to an end! And he's just screaming, and I was like, what is going on? Mm -hmm. And then he told me what happened, and honestly, I was completely stunned. I thought I was living in a dream. I mean, I think everyone in New York felt that they were living in a dream. I won't go into more detail around this, but let's just say that created a big shift in where I thought I was going. Mm -hmm. Um, My skin broke out like crazy. Mm. My digestion went to hell. Uh I had all these physical problems and things that I couldn't ignore. Uh And then they started to really take my attention and focus. So I was kind of forced into looking into the healing arts in a much deeper way at this time because I I had to almost for survival. Mm -hmm. And uh, so then that led me into yoga, into other forms of movement therapy, Pilates, um, different forms of dance, uh, ballet. And uh, then I started working a lot more deeply in body work. I started Mm -hmm. really seeing the power of going into the tissues and understanding the details of these you know, muscle tendon connections in the body mm-hmm. and understanding the architecture as everything you know, is held together as a whole. Mm-hmm. And so it's kind of skip forward to now. Um, I, you know, I, I had been exploring a lot of ways of working sort of from the outside in mm-hmm. to the body, but, but really seeing that a lot of people um, had issues and, and including myself, there were certain blockages that I couldn't quite get to, couldn't quite access and release. And then I discovered the power of the voice. Ooh. Okay. I know yeah. we've talked about I know we've talked about this, so I'm acting like it's excited like the first time I've heard it, but we've 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 had some conversations yeah, well, around it. So so I had this realization that um, that the voice is actually something that resonates from the inside out. Mm-hmm. It's not just coming out of the mouth. Mm-hmm. You know, we sort of take it for granted. I started seeing that there were places in the body and I started just listening to people's voices and just noticing that different people were able to sometimes connect their voice into their body. And then there were other people that their voice was sort of more locked in the head mm-hmm. and, uh, or just in different, you know, locked in different ways. And so I started exploring working with sound inside of the sessions of people using the voice in very particular ways, working with, um, techniques that help to stretch and relax the vocal cords, just like any other muscle in the body. And I started seeing the body opening up. And um, and then I just really started to, I guess this is the sort of more mysterious part of it. Um, once I started understanding this, I started getting guided intuitively around how to open up and unlock those details. I think because at that point I had a focus, I realized, oh, it's not just about alignment. This isn't just about being pain-free. Mm-hmm. you know, which was my main focus at that time. Um, but I started seeing, oh, no, the root of what led me on this journey was that I'm an artist, and I want to be able to fully express myself. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that changed the frame around the healing work that I, you know, was exploring. And that kind of, that just led me down the rabbit hole to where I am today. And mm-hmm. there's a lot of other, you know, variables that go into this. But that is the background. Got it. Um, and I also will we'll say that in the last um, couple of years, I've gone into much deeper inquiry around things like ballet and also um, singing, working with a, a vocal teacher and learning about opera and actually seeing how this is all very logical mm-hmm. um, in relationship to holding certain notes. The body has to hold resonant pathways, resonant space. Mm-hmm. So it's just been really fascinating journey. Nice. Yeah. Well, that, that's cool. I made some notes here because there were some things you were talking about that it's like I want to get in, but I want to make sure we kind of keep the the flow wow. of things. So before I get into sharing like my path to how we got here, um, I, I wanted to ask you a few questions of what you thought. Like, um, are we going to swear? <laughs> Only if we do it very passionately. Okay, promise. If you do it in a half-assed way. Uh, yeah, if, you, you know. <laughs> if we're going to half-ass you know, swear. If you do it for just, yeah. you know. 
Okay, got it. So, so we will swearing. Swearing is cool. Swearing is fine. I think swearing is good as long as it has a purpose, right? A purpose, purpose for swearing to emphasize, (laughs) to emphasize a point. Yes. Um. Let's see what else. Uh. We may or may not. We've talked about this before. We may or may not bring on other people, depending on how much. If we run out of things to talk we'll about, run out of things to well, this is about. true. So we may not, we may, we may not bring. I like the idea of bringing on more people too. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, I have and a few. We'll get into that whole dialogue around, yeah. like this new, these new paradigms of healing, which I really do sense is going to come through that. But and is there anything that you think would be really important? I don't know. I think just bringing up what we've been working on lately, like what's really up for us Mm -hmm. and then kind of letting that guide, that seems to be the, the piece that would be really um, interesting, no matter what it is or what it's from, be it like, you know, water that we're drinking on that's off to the side here or um, getting into the voice stuff that's been up for you lately or the different psychological things that I've been working with clients with knee pain on. Mm. So, yeah. So, so that seems to be it for now. I think that's the good context that we'll swear and we may bring on other people (laughs) as we, as we deem fit. (laughs) Okay. Um, is there anything else that's coming to mind to, to bring up? No, I think that's enough. Okay, cool. Yeah. Well, um, let's see. My path. Who is Bill? Online, I'm known. Who am I? Gosh. I'm known as the knee pain guru online. Ooh, sounds pretty fancy, doesn't it? Yeah. Uh, yes. However, I got that title as a result of my learning curve being exceptionally flat. <laughs> for exceptionally flat for a period of time in my life uh, where I uh, dislocated my left knee four times. I tore, ended up, by the time I dislocated it the fourth time, I decided, you know, maybe I should go see a doctor and get this checked out. And it, yeah, it was, it was bad. Why are men like that? Oh gosh. I think it's like that's something I've noticed in a lot of males. They just will not go to get help unless it's absolutely yeah. just agony. Yeah, and I think there's a component of ego involved. Yeah. There's a component of not uh being weak in and around that. You know what? I'm going to try it. Let me pull this this out so Can you hear me? Did I just screw up the video? Megwin? Oh, yeah. Okay. Am I back? Here. You just kind of froze on me, but. Okay. Got yeah. it. Okay. Um, why do men do that? I think it's ego. I think a portion of it is. Um, stubbornness a portion of it is not wanting to appear a weak um so kind of all ego no things but aspects yeah of the ego. I, I like aspects of the ego uh, yeah. for me i didn't want there was a part of me that didn't want to admit that something was wrong kind of like the ostrich syndrome if i stick my head in the sand and i don't deal with it it'll go away no. Be, and because yeah. because there was this, I'd been in judo for let's see when I injured it in two thousand, so I'd been in judo for eight or nine years, and no matter what the injury was, you know, black eyes, twisted ankles, whatever it was, there was this point where everything healed if given enough time, but then I had this knee thing that was like a joint injury, something was torn. That was yeah. different than I'd ever had before, and I didn't equate something being torn with <laughs> my invulnerability. Like I, I thought it was like 
I had this bulletproof shield on my chest or something like that, mm. that my body would recover. So there was a disconnect for me in understanding that something that was broken or torn in my knee wasn't going to heal unless I did something different mm. and just not wanting to admit it, just not wanting to admit. What was that like in terms of like when you had that realization that you had to do something and shift? What was the feeling like? I'm just curious. Was it like, oh, crap, now I have to focus on this? Or was it like, you know what? This is awesome. Now I get to learn this whole new thing. Like, I'm just curious what your perspective uh, yeah, was. It, you know that, that second example that you gave? Oh, this is awesome. This is a new thing I'm going yeah. to learn. That never occurred to me at the point that I got. <laughs> so here. That's a bigger leap. It was, yeah, it was, I, I yeah. think it's definitely a, a progression. And for me, the last time I dislocated my left knee, I was playing softball. I was shortstop and a ground ball was hit straight to me. I scooped up the ball. I stepped and I threw to first base and then I heard this pop. And the next thing I remember was my knee. Like I, I was grabbing, clutching my knee to my chest and I heard this screaming and it was this blood curdling. You heard the screaming? You heard yourself screaming? Or well, you the, some other? this is the part yeah, of it. I'm it was sorry, like there was a part that I disconnected from myself Whoa. and I heard like somebody screaming. Wow. And I have my knee clutched to my chest. And then I heard it again, and then I realized it was me. There was this, it was like it was such a traumatic thing that happened just like that and gone. And now it's, I can't, there There was a point of not trusting my knee. Now, at this point, I've already been doing this for five months. Like, this was the fourth time something like that had happened. Right. And I, I wasn't doing judo. I took a pause on judo. I obviously I wasn't going skiing anymore, which was the first time. Then I did it second time in judo. Then it was volleyball. And then it was softball. And I got to this place where it was like, whoa, this is serious. <laughs> like I have no idea what's going on now. And I'm going to need help outside of myself. Mm. Um, so my teammates carried me off the field. In my knee swollen and all that, and I made an appointment with one of the orthopedic surgeons for the University of Louisville. I was living in Louisville, Kentucky at the time to um, to take a look at my knee to figure out what's going on because it wasn't things weren't working right. So that was it. Wasn't like I was looking forward to this great, great learning experience of. Right. Of this, it was like, honestly, it was like the end of my world. Like, right. not that makes a, sense. That's similar to how mine started. Yeah. You know? Yeah, it's so interesting. It, and there, there's this place where I believe that the universe, God, whatever your belief system is, will present these experiences in your life to change your direction. Like, there's a mm -hmm. part, of, part of me that wasn't listening to the subtle cues. Like the first three times I dislocated my knee. Mm. And finally it had, I had to completely tear the ligament to finally get it that I needed to change directions and go and do something else. Um, so that, that's, yeah. So I ended up going to the doctor. The doctor told me my minute, um, the ligament, the ACL ligament in my left knee was torn and that I need reconstructive surgery. Um, well, I, I actually wouldn't need it. He gave me the option. He's like, there's plenty of people that walk around without ACLs. But I couldn't picture myself not doing judo again, not being in martial arts, and have that fear of my knee popping out like it did that last time. So I had the surgery a month later. They took out... They repaired, they did, they call it a patella replacement, so they took part of my patella tendon, put a pin in my lower leg, in the tibia, and a pin in my femur, and recreated the ligament in my left knee. They took out two pieces of meniscus, and I did three months of physical therapy. Now, in my mind, 
once they repair the ligament, I'm good to go. Like I'm thinking of it like, you know, yeah. I'm taking my car to the mechanics. Right. I I just change the tires or I change the oil or I get, you know, whatever repaired, then I'm I'm back on the road. Right. And that's where the journey began. That mm-hmm. it was like, oh, the left leg is as strong as the right leg, but I still have swelling in my knee. I still have pain in my knee. I still have pain in my body and it's compensating and all that. So that's where, that's where the learning opportunity came was at that point where it's like, Oh geez, all this energy that I had put into martial arts and working out and lifting weights and riding bikes and running now had to be channeled somewhere else. And it was all channeled so I can get back on the judo mat so I could throw people again, Mm. which is what I wanted to do. So that was 2000 when I had the surgery and I started taking classes and learning things. And I, I ended up working on clients. I got involved in an osteopathically based style of body work called orthobionomy. We've talked about this. And a Russian martial arts, Sistema, which has a huge healing component to it. And over the past 18 years, 19 years going on, it was just the accumulation of the study that I've done in those two areas, as well as other things that I saw to be applicable to Mm. adding value to what I was doing. Now, this is the interesting thing, right? That um, there's no clear path into that healing and you you know, had these very, these two very divergent kind of paths, but somehow you were drawn to them. Mm-hmm. And then I'm, I'm, I'm assuming when you kind of told me this, that you've synergized a lot of these two aspects into the work that you're doing now. Mm. And, uh, how, cause how did you, how did you find that? Like, how did you find the confidence to follow these two things? Or like what, was it just the intuition? Was it, you know, pure curiosity, like, uh, what would you say? I, I think this is important for other people, like, yeah. you know, their I, healing journey. I don't know if I had the confidence. Like, it, it didn't come out of a confidence thing. It came out of this place of, well, what the hell else am I going to do? Mm-hmm. I couldn't do judo, and I my whole identity was wrapped around in judo. You know, in being a guy, and sta- you know, standing, like how tough can a guy look if he's limping, (laughs) right? How tough can a guy, if, um, in terms of like relationships wise, there, there's a natural piece that a guy wants to be able to protect the woman that he's with and, and, you know, be that strong, (laughs) strong, strong dude. Yeah. And if, if I'm limping, if I'm concerned about not even being able to take care of myself, how am I going to be able to take care of anyone else that's around me? So I'd always kind of prided myself in that people could rely on me because of being that strong kind of guy. And it just wasn't there. You know, you go out and it's like, oh, hold on. <laughs> my knee's swelling up or my knee's stiff. Right. So... I couldn't go back to my old life and I didn't know what my new life looked like. So I, the, the drive was to continue studying and learning how I can get my knee back to normal. Um, and and that was really the driving force. And, uh, so I just kept on and I, and I like learning stuff curiosity is really cool like oh well if i walk on my knee on a concrete floor and my knee actually feels better and that was something that i never thought to equate the two and i was like oh that's pretty neat so i needed to look i was looking in places that didn't seem apparent well, you're also looking through an experiential lens, uh-huh. which I think is really important for the conversation of new paradigms and healing. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> because I think right now, so many of us are dealing with accumulation, 
not just a physical trauma, but emotional traumas Mm -hmm. and things, you know, that are passed down, you know, lineage kind of DNA stuff. And there are not always the answers outside of us Uh to tell us that you have to go this particular pathway. And so that's kind of why I was asking that question, because I think it's important to remember that new healing modalities emerge Mm -hmm through experiential learning, through experiential data that Mm -hmm. we gain from uh, having to go through these kinds of things. And to, so that's kind of what I wanted to like explore maybe a little bit. Uh, Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Are are we going to, are we going to talk about woo woo stuff on these calls? We should. I think, yeah, probably. But the thing is what I just said is not woo woo. It's, we are as a human being, we are emotional, Mm -hmm. physical, Mm -hmm. and we are soulful beings. Mm -hmm. And so I think in a lot of the Western paradigms of healing, Mm -hmm. you know, we look at anything that's non-physical, that's not something that we can prove in in a laboratory as being Mm woo-woo, but every single human being is dealing with the same kinds of crisis, the same emotional issues. Yeah. And these things manifest in our physical body. Mm -hmm. And so I think we have to expand the lens and not take anybody's word for, you know, truth. It's not about following, following someone like a sheep and being like, ah, this, you know, new Kool-Aid will cure me, Mm -hmm. you know? Um, But really, I mean, in my own process of healing, it has been hugely connected to the experiential realm. Mm -hmm. If I don't feel it in my body, if I don't have that shift, that experiential shift, Mm -hmm. I really don't believe it. Or I don't, you know what I mean? I don't explore further than that. And uh, I think that kind of learning has in some ways been mm, not as encouraged. I think it's, you know, where we are all learning through our experiences but I think in terms of these new paradigms of healing that are emerging, many of them have come through unique experiences like yours and mine, where we have to kind of go off the beaten path and we've discovered things. Mm-hmm. And so that's, um, and I think just, you know, even calling it spiritual woo woo, sometimes it's not. I mean, there is spiritual woo-woo stuff out there, and I think Mm -hmm. it's usually things like you just, you know, it's very etheric and kind of more abstract. Mm -hmm. Um, But what I'm really talking about is that that experiential realm. Like, how does it actually feel in your body? Like, you had mentioned the concrete. Mm -hmm. That wasn't something that someone had told you. Mm -hmm. wasn't something you had read in a book. Right. It was an experience. And that experience then led you into curiosity, Mm -hmm. right? And so the same thing has been true for my own work. You know, it's this experience of feeling, wow, my voice, I can feel there's a connection between the vibration here and my sexual center where I had been traumatized. And then I look into the anatomy and I see, whoa, the vocal cords and the pelvic floor, they're like very close anatomical mirrors of each other. What the hell? Yeah. That made me curious. Uh huh. That made me curious then to go in deeper, you know, and the deeper, you know, I went, the more interesting it became, but mm-hmm. it was through experiential practices and learning mm-hmm. that this healing modality emerged. Um, I will say that, that um, <clears throat> there was a lot of skepticism in my own space around mm-hmm. what I was discovering. Mm-hmm. Um, so it wasn't just like, I am discovering this thing and it's gonna, you know, it was like, I was discovering and I was sharing very carefully. Mm-hmm. And I, as I started sharing with people that also knew more than me mm-hmm. in certain dom- domains, like working with opera singers or working with trauma experts or working with, you know, people that were brain surgeons or just randomly sort of kind of coming across these different people and then sharing And then they would say, this actually makes sense in relationship. And then they would give me another piece. Yeah. And then that kind of led me into trusting, you know, myself a lot more. Did you, I know this to be true for myself. Did you 
get to be really good at being a chameleon? Meaning, meaning, meaning like you talk to the brain surgeon and you have to pre present your information or ask questions in a way that lands for the brain surgeon. Or you have the energy healer and you change the way you use the terminology for the energy healer or you're working with a client depending on where they're at they can they can't necessarily relate to oh gosh how am I gonna for instance people who don't believe in energy I would present the information like okay let's say you're in a car accident and you flatline and they rush you to the hospital and you go into the emergency room and they shock you back to life with those pads that are plugged into the wall. <laughs> you know, right? The energy that you can't see that's plugged into the wall that the power company sends them a bill for. So you <laughs> that's don't really creative. I didn't I never say I get that creative. But but, <laughs> but what I'm saying but what I'm saying is people who don't believe in energy need to have a concrete example of how energy does apply I guess from my own work I don't talk about it in such kind of etheric terms usually I focus more on giving people the experience so um, and I try to I try to see the person as a whole mm -hmm. so even when I was working with the brain surgeon he was someone that was actually open to some dimensions of spirituality he was Indian and also was dealing with some of his own emotional, there was some emotional stuff coming up for him at the mm -hmm. time. So we had engaged in conversation and I had told him a little bit about what I was doing on a structural level and how it, I'm seeing it help on an emotional level. And mm -hmm. he was very curious and just very open. And I think with, it was, was very fascinating with him because I'm thinking he's a brain surgeon. Like he knows everything about the brain. I mean, mm -hmm. he's doing surgery that could kill someone with one false move. Like this is, you oh, know, wow. he really, really understands this stuff. But he, what I really saw was that because that particular paradigm is so from the outside in, he was craving information that was mm. actually coming from a new perspective. Mm. So with him and with most people that I do work with, um, because I feel like the strongest grounding point is actually the physical body and understanding how it connects logically. Mm -hmm. um, and for myself, I know that that has helped me to go deeper into the work. So I you know, talk about it more in terms of neural pathways. Mm -hmm. As these neural pathways open up, you know, the energy starts flowing. Mm -hmm. And so with him, that really worked well. He, you know, he, he really understood Oh yeah, you're right. Absolutely, all these neural connection points are here, and uh, you know it really made sense to him. But I didn't talk about it in terms of like, um, and I do see this though, you know, more within my work that there are these meridians in the body, mm -hmm. and um, you know there have been more recent studies around this where they have been finding studies that I can't say that they've proven the presence of meridians, but it looks. Like, there, there definitely are these meridians, mm -hmm. right? Um, but for me, I, I focused more of my own work around, let me just give you the experience, and then you can, you know, you can go from there and see if, see how that feels for you. Mm -hmm. Because I don't have access to a laboratory. I'm not able to prove my theories at this point. But does that mean that these things should not be shared? Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, and explored. And so I think that this is kind of the new context, maybe, of this new dimension of healing that we're in is just allowing the relevance of experiential learning to be just as important and valid mm -hmm. as something like, you know, going into the laboratory and doing these kind of tests um, and that we can then have these conversations and dialogues because all the conversations and dialogues that I've had with different experts have helped me so much in mm -hmm. in going deeper because as I said, I was the number one skeptic. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking as I'm doing this stuff, honestly, this is weird. Mm -hmm. This is strange. I can't share this with people. It's too weird. How am I going to explain it? Like, for instance, there was something that was happening when I started to, I think what happens a lot in people's bodies is that as trauma gets released, 
it's like an internal medicine. It's this internal alchemy sometimes that, that comes up. Our okay. body teaches us how to heal itself. Right. This has been my experience. And so I was doing strange things where um, this energy was releasing. It's, uh, and like I was finding that, for instance, if I would be able to release my tongue mm, and hold mm -hmm. it out and make vibration and sound through here, mm -hmm. that I would feel much more grounded that all of a sudden I felt just safer, mm -hmm. that my voice started to change, that things started to shift. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but I still thought it was weird. Mm -hmm. I still thought, well, how am I going to share this with people? I can't, you know what I mean? Like explain, but it seems to be working. And then I discovered a friend, um, who is a trauma expert who's got her PhD in, you know, trauma therapy. And she explained to me, she's like, Oh, you're, you're working on the vagus nerve. This makes so much and sense it, why this is, you know, helping. It, this is the piece that I'm talking about, chameleon. That it's okay. like, how do I present it to someone? I, like, I just, I just connected these dots. And my experience of it is very different than what anyone else out there has ever told me or talked to me about. How do I present it? How do, yes. how do I present it to my client? How do I talk to other professionals about it? Because I'm still trying to gel this in my head. So I think there, that is important. Yeah, but there, it's like I need to present to get more information to make it valid. Just like you said, you talk to your friend. He's like, oh, you're working with the, the vagus nerve. Yeah. Which, by the way, for those that are listening, the vagus nerve runs down from the base of your skull all the way down and affects like everything. Yeah, pretty much on many, many organs. So it really is the, the nerve that connects our brain to our visceral organs and mm -hmm. it's also connected to our fight or flight response. Our stomach. Yeah. Pregnant women who get sick, the vagus nerve is like all whacked out because, you know, it's I like, know yeah, it's like the whole uh, morning sickness thing. The, mm -hmm. the body, the body's actually perceiving the fetus as a threat. So it's going between being the nurturing mother and I have this wonderful thing growing inside of me and the body's going, no, 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 wait a minute, this is really bad. <laughs> like we, it, So the vagus nerve is jumping back and forth. It's out of whack. And yeah, working wow. with C1 at the base of the, the skull, uh, working with cranial <laughs> bones, that's why we talk. That's why we're talking. Okay. This is, we're, we're, we're really showing you know exactly what we're talking about here um and it also is true for it is i think the old paradigm of our healing is that we we imagine that the healers the doctors people with the answers have to have all the answers they're the experts right mm -hmm. you go to them they're like the oracle mm -hmm. and so many of us don't believe in our power you know as we start to find these things because we're like, well, no one, you know, dubbed me this, this kind of healer. Um, I will say that I've learned more in just working with clients mm -hmm. than anything. I learned so much from working with clients, and they often just fill in the gaps of different information like you just did right mm -hmm. now. Yeah. Because it's so hard for any one person to have, you know, you just can't have yeah. all of the answers. It's impossible. Okay, okay. Give us a nugget. <laughs> Give us a nugget of something you learn with clients. Um, well, a lot of it has been, I'm just trying to think of something, you know, more recent. Um, I think a lot of it for me has been just really seeing the connections between the emotions. Mm -hmm. Like I'm working with a, a few singers right now and just seeing how connected, um, the performance of singing is to also the feeling of confidence and emotional confidence. Mm -hmm. um, so in working with them, I have seen that it has been just as important to also address some of those emotional energies and connections that are going on just as it is just as much as it is important to focus on the technique mm -hmm. of singing and the physical aspect of singing. And that's something that I've just, you know, through the experience of working with someone, because in my brain, I'm like, I'm going to open up this structural thing and we're going to have this. But it's like, oh, no, no, it's actually emotions, mm -hmm. resistance around feeling this confidence, mm -hmm. you know. And so, so then sometimes I have to, I find myself, oh, I'm going into almost like a mother energy, you know, and helping to create space 
for that emotion to be acknowledged and to, to kind of help that person release whatever the shame is that's disconnecting them mm -hmm. from really tapping into the deeper, you know, dimensions of the voice. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's, but there's got, I'm just not thinking of anything like specific. Okay. Right I'll, offhand. I'll give you a that's specific, kind of general. I'll yeah. give you a specific one. My own personal experience, it, how it's been with my business, mm. the knee pain thing. I, I've been studying the body and doing things for the past 18, 19 years. Um, in 2008, I'm like, oh, I see this internet business model. This will be a perfect thing for me to get into. And all I need to do is create this product and start driving Google AdWords traffic to it and write a sales page. Wow. You know, I mean, but, but, <laughs> but here, here's, I'll, I will land the plane here. It's the mechanics of it there wasn't, it was too mechanical. There wasn't, I didn't have a connection with the people that I was trying to help. I knew what was better for them, but they had no emotional connection to it. So they're like, well, who's this guy? He's full of shit. He's on the internet. He's bullshitting people. He's trying to scam people, which, you know, just that whole statement makes me think, well, I could think of a hell of a lot easier ways to scam people on the internet than coming up with knee pain as as my angle but but there was that whole piece of and that we we've spoken about this back in June of this year I just started letting go of all of those things that I didn't like doing that I didn't like involving myself with that thinking that if I did this then I would get that meaning if I um did this right technique for business, then I would get these better results. And really what I found is it's more about connecting, like getting to that emotional component. And when people really feel how much you care, like you want them to get better and realizing my frustration was coming out of the fact that I wasn't able to help the people that had knee pain. Like they weren't believing me. So I double my efforts and I try more, which created more tension in my body and more disconnected from the emotional component. Mm -hmm. And um, once I let go of that, then I, I settle down into this ease and flow of my business and realizing that the person that I was speaking to on the phone to, to share one of my products with them, maybe they weren't a good fit for it. It didn't, it wasn't for everybody. Right. And, and that's how this, this, uh, these calls came about. It was, you know, it's like, I'm, we're doing this because we enjoy talking to each other and yeah. just kind of like talking shop, so to speak about what we enjoy about the body. Not because I have some intention of driving pay-per-click advertising or doing something like that. But that it's sharing the information, more people get to know who we are as people. And if that resonates with someone, they can contact us. They can reach out to us and say, hey, Megwin, would you help me? Bill, would you help me? I believe you have something that would be of value. So I, I think that's, that's what I hear you saying. And that was the experience in my life of how that turned out. Yeah, I mean, I can... I can uh relate to that um, more recently and I think this is something that I have struggled with in my own journey as I sort of started to change in my own healing modality because for many years I was a body worker for many years I was doing you know more movement therapy so it was this really awkward experience of like well guys I'm doing slightly different work now and mm. you know try, kind of trying to educate people around these things and then trying to also fit within certain uh, structures. Mm -hmm. So people used to tell me, oh, you can't write very many, you can't write so much because people only have a short attention span. Yeah. And so then I found myself be being affected by that. Okay, well, I have to just say it really fast, and then that made me feel frazzled and kind of disconnected yeah. me from the, yes. the core of what it is, that yeah. where my work was actually going. And I think that as I've been releasing that, just being like, you know what? Not everybody's going to resonate, um, and 
the most important thing is the evolution of the, the, the offering and of actually connecting to what people need and to, to, to meeting people on that emotional level. Mm -hmm. Um, and it has, uh, for me, it has led me also into, um, becoming more aware that there's more creative potential in also healing. Uh, for instance, you know, now my own work, I feel I will evolve it a lot more, uh, as I do classes around acting mm -hmm. and sort of, sort of invite these techniques in sort of more of the performance art dimension. Mm -hmm. And, uh, that was a huge leap from just doing body work even though the body work is really, a lot of it is really where the roots of my understanding of how now to work with actors. Mm -hmm. But I think the guiding light, and I think this is, I guess I'm speaking to other healers out there that may be on a similar kind of journey and, uh, and uh, have maybe difficulties around evolving their own modality because they get caught and well, I'm certified in such and such mm -hmm. modality, right? Or I'm certified in also this modality, but now this whole nother th thing is emerging. How do I go into this? How do I explore it? So for me, the, the guiding light is actually what, what kind of class would I want? You know, what mm -hmm. kind of experience would I need to kind of go into that next dimension of experiencing, you know, the freedom, um, and that has led me into be kind of finding these new creative forms mm -hmm. and also finding the people, you know, that really resonate on that same wavelength. Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, and in the end, I think that's really how new, um, new things do emerge. We have to follow wherever our passion actually is. And I think that can be challenging. But obviously having a community like what we're creating inside of this conversation mm -hmm. of people that are experts in different kinds of uh, domains <laughs> really helps to, to, to kind of foster that kind of evolution yeah. in healing. I think when, when people realize they're not alone, like that's what the knee pain was. When I had knee pain, I felt like I was the only one in the world that had knee pain. Felt isolated. Mm -hmm. I'm sure when you experience the trauma that you experience and you're going through it, there's this sense of feeling isolated and you don't know who to talk to because everyone seems, it already feels threatening. So how do I find other people that feel threatened in the same way that I've experienced the threatening? So I, I think um, in you know talking about the new directions in healing therapy is about kind of shining that, being that lighthouse for other people to go, hey, oh, they're doing this thing. And it sounds like it makes sense to me. And I I can really relate with them and resonate with them and, and reach out and get support from them or listen to what they're saying and go, yeah, yeah, they get it. They understand it. And I think there's clients that struggle with this, people that have experienced trauma or pain in their body. There's also therapists that are out there that are on their path, earlier versions of ourselves mm -hmm. that are kind of like, man, what am I doing? What am I, how am I figuring this out? Um, they're, yeah, they're right. My modality, I, I learned it and I see the value in it, but I've had other experiences that have evolved that. So now it looks yeah. different. Yeah, that's probably the hardest leap to make, actually, I would say. For, for me, for myself, it was the hardest leap to go from learning uh, someone else's healing modality, which was brilliant mm -hmm. and uh, very developed, into there's still something more. There's still something that there's another piece here. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that that is true, that we do need you know, to be kind of guiding light around that because mm -hmm. I'm, I know that that happens for so many people and I'm sure it's happening on a very large scale in the times that we are in because it's calling for these new healing modalities to come forth. Mm -hmm. um, we are at a very interesting time where <laughs> post-traumatic stress disorder is at an all-time high. We yeah. just had this crazy election. Uh, it feels like September 11th again yeah. in New York. 
it feels like this kind of, I mean, but even worse in some ways, I, I, I have to say, like, there's something about, and I don't say worse to be any kind of doomsday, I just mean that the actual trauma feels more, more, uh, there's more consciousness around, mm -hmm. oh my God, we are in a state of trauma. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that, I think that the internet is going to be one of the most important aspects to actually emerging these new healing modalities um, because it's going to allow us to share our thoughts, our ideas, to become beacons inside of these different strands. Mm -hmm. I think we're all part of one nervous system, mm -hmm. you know? And so there, uh, the internet is going to help us to come together in a kind of harmonic way in in a kind of um, well, we'll be able to more easily synergize mm -hmm. some of these different aspects. I think we're just kind of beginning to find that mm -hmm. space um, through conversations, uh, through hopefully more and more experiential forms of learning that we can do, you know, directly through the internet. Mm -hmm. And um, um, but I think that we need to look at the times that we are in as a very amazing opportunity right now to mm. also merge together the aspects of science and technology and spirituality mm -hmm. that never before in history have we been at a time where these aspects could merge so easily mm -hmm. because we have the access to the information the knowledge is within us each individual mm -hmm. brings their own body of knowledge mm -hmm. you know and that's really exciting because in the old model of healing there were there is this still the dimension of ego my healing modality it's the way mm -hmm. you know i have the answers you know there's this kind of um they they have an they uh, have an answer <laughs> there yes. is an answer yes right <clears throat> and that's the and, and, and so, <clears throat> but I think now it's like, I actually really see the opportunity as a, there's a lot of, that's like so much weight and responsibility, first of all, in any one person, okay? So even if someone has a lot of the answers, that is too much responsibility for mm. one person. Like, that really is not personally where I would like to be. Right. I want to be able to live my life, to be relaxed, to stay in my vulnerability, to to learn, to be open, to connect, you know, to not have to be like the oracle. Right. Yeah. No one, no, nobody has to be the oracle. Maybe as we come together, we can be the oracle together. Yeah. <laughs> it, well, there's that. And, and uh, as I'm thinking about this process, I think people who are in pain and trauma, they're looking for a singular answer. Right. And, instead of looking for a piece from someone who has to share what they have to share and using that along their path. Yeah. I think there's something though important to say is that um, if there is something to commitment to a particular path um, in the sense that, you know, in order to get the benefits from any kind of Ooh, healing modality, yeah. we can't just like try it out one day and then, you know, I've had people do an exercise, you know, that I've taught them and they're like, Ooh, but I still have that block in my throat, and I I'm like it's gonna take more yeah. than one time doing yeah. this exercise, yeah. you know. And that's the sort of culture that we, you know, it's like this quick fix thing. You want to go to that fixer upper, mm -hmm. you know, person to fix you. And we have to look at healing in a completely new way. Healing is actually this creative opportunity to understand the deeper dimensions. I think finding the root of what is that, that access point into actually clearing whatever that mm -hmm. is out completely. Yeah. And I think it's gonna be different for every person, but there is something to committing. You know, yeah. it is important, like if you're gonna study with someone, do commit to learning with that person. If you feel that you have a synergy and 
also have that mental level awareness that this person does not necessarily have all the answers. Yeah. And that's okay. R remind, <laughs> reminds me of that saying, um, if you, I don't remember where it came from, but it says, if you meet the Buddha along the way, kill him. <laughs> but, but it's that, that idea that the moment we put somebody up on a pedestal and we think they're going to do the be all end all and have all the answers for me, that's the moment that they fall off that pedestal and you realize they have no clothes on, you know, and you're like so let down and so upset because they lied to me and they didn't tell me the truth. And the reality of it is that no one is like that, that has all the answers and just going into that understanding that no one has all the answers allows us that space for that person to be human, us to be human, and to learn and see that it's it's a journey, not a destination. Yeah, and I, I like that idea of journey, not a destination. And one frame that I've been looking at this through is that reframing healing altogether as a creative project, as a creative <laughs> that's great. Yep, as a yep. creative project, just like you're creating anything, making a painting. This is actually a creative opportunity to, to understand something so deep that you would never have had, had access to had this whatever occurred. You know, like for me, okay, this is hilarious. So I'm struggling with the, you know, this trauma coming out through my skin. I had terrible acne. I, mm. I had people on the street. One guy once had literally stopped me on the street, and he looks at me and he says, What's wrong with your face? Whoa. Yeah. That's I that's couldn't intense. look at myself in the mirror. Uh -huh. That's how bad it was. And I remember hearing a, a voice inside. And the voice said, take a picture of your face because you won't have this forever. You're going to understand why you had to go through this. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the irony that now I'm doing courses on the face. Yeah. Uh. You know, and I'm in front, I'm on the camera. I never, I couldn't look at myself in the mirror hey. while, you know, going to the bathroom. Mm. That's how deep, you know. So I think I didn't under, I couldn't understand back then, you know, that that was where it was headed. But I think that's important for people to understand that, that I, you know, one goes from point A to point Z. And in order to stay in the game, mm -hmm. in order to get to Z, you got to look at it as a creative opportunity. Yep. You got to, because you will not get the answers from one person. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, we initially <laughs> talked about this being like a 30 minute. I knew it was going to be an hour. Yeah. Okay. I kind of, you know, need to <laughs> have time to warm up, have time to warm up a little bit and it's fine. No, it's okay. And I think, um, in in the future, once we because this we're recording this on Skype, and as we get the technology worked out, this will be a live stream mm. where people can actually type in questions, so we can set aside yeah. a time to like look at who's asking questions or what questions we have received, and we can talk about those things or give us a direction or a topic to talk about. Questions are fun. I questions know. Are curiosity. Make them good them. though. Don't don't. Ask like you gotta ask good questions. Shaving people about their questions. Yes, already. <laughs> yes. Well, well, people won't do their due diligence. It's like I here, here's a for instance. Like I'll get people on the internet, oh. and they'll be like, "Well, it hurts when I extend my knee. What's wrong with my knee?" And they didn't go to a doctor and get a diagnosis. So they're looking for me to be like the okay, doctor. Well, we filter the questions. We will we're filter gonna the answer, questions. We are going to answer the questions that seem the most exciting. Perfect. <laughs> yes. So the people that ask poor questions, we won't shame them. They won't even make it up on here. We will ignore you. I'll be like that. Okay. Little, I think that is good. That's a good motivator. Good motivator to ask good questions. <laughs> okay. Well, cool. Uh, so how would people get in touch with you if they wanted to chat with you more? What would be the yeah. way to do it? 
Well, you can go to my website, which mm-hmm. is embodyvoice.com. Okay. And the best way is really to sign up for the newsletter because I do send out regular newsletters and um, really keep people in this conversation mm-hmm. around this dimension of healing. And um, so that's really the best way so Im- to, to get to go to my website, www.embodyvoice.com. Voice. Okay, I will. We'll put that. We'll put that in the description of the video, yeah. so it's all spelled correctly, and the link works. So we'll do that. Embodyvoice.com, and then um, yeah. So we will put that in the description for those who want to contact me. You can go to the kneepainguru.com. Get on my list. If you want to send me an email, you can send it to customer service at the kneepainguru.com, <laughs> and those will get to me as well. Um, but that's, we're going to wrap it up for today. We will do these well, once a week for now, yes. once a week, we'll get to Hello. chat so and, uh, gosh, I'm looking at my notes. I'm like, we didn't even get to like some of the fun stuff like art Dom. Ah! Next time. Next time. Next time. This is a pre preview. Art Dom. What, what do we say? And for, <laughs> for our next call, for Megan. Our next- Oh. Megwin will talk about art dom. Yeah, art doming. Whoa, okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, cool. So we're going to wrap it up for today. Uh, this will be on my YouTube channel, the Knee Pain Guru uh, YouTube channel, with, where all of these videos will be housed. And like I said, reach out to us if you have any uh, questions or uh, support you need from either of us. Oh, and they can follow me on Twitter. Twitter Ooh. is this new... I never really was into Twitter, but I just love Twitter. Yeah. And on my Twitter account, which is basically M E G W Y N, we'll get that. I we'll get that in the notes. I love to share yeah. different things about it. I love to explore all sorts of different things on my Twitter account, but I, I people follow me on Twitter. You're a tweeter. I will, I will, I'm a tweeter now. Nice. Very nice. <laughs> well, cool. Well, we'll put all of our social media links in the description as well for whoever would like to follow us and be our friends. Please, please. No, she. No. I, I don't care if you want to be my friend or not. I'm okay. I like you, Megwin. We're good. I'm good with that. Okay, I'm good too. Okay, we're gonna <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna wrap it up for today, and we will see everybody next week. Bye. Bye.